You are listening to the Bring the SEO podcast with John Romaine, episode number six. Welcome to the Bring the SEO podcast. We provide business development training for SEO consultants wanting to improve their processes, increase profits and scale to $100,000 a month or more without all the stress and overwhelm. And now your host, John Romaine. Okay, Alex, um, thanks for jumping on today. Really appreciate it. Maybe you could start by um, telling the listeners who you are, where you're based, and what it is that you do. Thanks, John. Yeah, so I'm Alex. I'm the co-founder of Sprint Law. Sprint Law is an online-based law firm for small businesses. Uh, We were founded in Australia in 2017. Our business model is all about making legal services easy, accessible, affordable for small businesses. We started the company sort of realizing that for a lot of smaller businesses, lawyers were a thing that either seemed too complicated or confusing to use or was just something that people really didn't enjoy doing. And as a result, a lot of small businesses in Australia where we first started you know, weren't consuming legal services and ended up often in, in kind of legal trouble or you know, with risks that could have easily been avoided had they had legal advice. So the mission of the business has kind of been, can we design a model that's accessible, easy, affordable for all these small businesses and make sure that they're kind of as protected as larger organizations. And launched the business in Australia in 2017, have expanded to the UK and as of December last year, New Zealand, we've got a bit over um, 4,000 clients. Um, and we were recently named the fastest growing legal business in Asia Pacific, which I'm very proud of. So um, sort of uh, growing quickly, but but also have big visions because really our, our mission is all about helping small businesses everywhere. And there's tons of them in the markets that we're in. Mm. Um, one thing that I was attracted to initially, and I mean, I was uh, given the referral and sent your way by one of the members inside the group was the fact that you had a really good understanding of the online space, mm. which was something that I think, um, and just correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of legal firms perhaps might be lagging in this area. You start mm. talking about online services, you know, we what we talk about primarily is SEO. I, I felt uh, at times that a lot of legal firms don't necessarily have a good understanding of how that space works, and some of them just don't want to have anything to do with that at all. So would you say that would be a fair comment? For sure. I think, um, you know, we are ourselves an online business, which kind of helps un- us understand, you know, online small businesses or startup companies who who have kind of similar business models or operations. Law firms in the legal industry in general are, you know, very much traditional businesses. A lot of them, you know, don't do much online or they're increasingly doing stuff online, but have found it very difficult to use technology. Um, it's not part of necessarily the culture of the legal industry to be tech forward, to be using technology or digital marketing. That's kind of one of the reasons we started the business was that we saw this like very fragmented old fashioned industry that yeah. wasn't really familiar with what was going on. And we thought, mm-hmm. well, a new, a new type of lawyer is needed both to reach customers online, but also understand these kind of online tech enabled business models for sure. Yeah. It's definitely something that I've experienced. I've reached out to a number of um, uh, law firms with various requests and yeah, there, there definitely seem to be gaps there, especially, like I said, in the online space. Um, why do you think that is? Why Why do you think there is, is it, a, is it, is it latency? Is there lag? Are they eventually going to catch up? Yeah, look, I don't know if, how much the traditional lawyers will change. Like, um, I think models like ours that are kind of growing very quickly online may just become really large and 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 start to service a, a bigger portion of the market. And one of the reasons I, I think we may be successful is because of what you just said. I just think lawyers are finding it very difficult, um, you know, to understand a lot of the way that digital business works. I do think that it's a generational thing and like the next generation mm. of lawyers are, are being trained a little bit differently by law schools and so on and and um and are a bit more tech savvy and you know just in their personal lives grow up using online businesses and those sorts of things so i do think you know eventually yeah. your average lawyer is going to understand that most i mean most contracts they would sign themselves in their personal life will be agreeing to terms and conditions of a social media platform or signing contracts online so they, they'll start to see in the practice of law and the way that it operates this digital stuff and maybe understand it a bit better. Um, mm. But um, it's certainly, I think, going to be slower than it should be for what what what, what the way the world's moving now. Yeah. yeah, and I think, I mean, the digital space is moving so rapidly and things are ever-changing that it's probably really hard 
I would guess, to try and stay up to, you know, stay up to date and, you know, what is um, taking place, especially from a legal perspective. I mean, as SEOs, we can, things are always changing and that's, that's the nature of uh, the business that we're in. But unlike, um, you know, SEO, where you can make a mistake and, you know, you can go back and fix that up. Legal is a lot different because <laughs> mm, if you no. screw something up, you, there's, there's consequences. For sure. And it's one of those things where, you know, part of the reason people haven't in invested that much in automation and technology and, and so on is because law is not something where, you know, 80% is good enough or 90% is good enough. It has to be 100% right. And, mm, and, and yeah. there's high risk of getting things wrong. And I think, um, you know, part of the other aspect is that the law is struggling to catch up with technology and what's going on, like to working out how to regulate these things that are changing mm. so quickly, working out how to regulate algorithms is difficult. And so, and law is by nature always one step behind technological innovation because it needs to happen and then regulators right. consider it. Yeah. But, but right now there's a lot of trouble um, in, in, in the regulatory environment dealing with, you know, things like digital marketing and, um, and search algorithms and, you know, AI, the chat GPT stuff, like how are you going to regulate those things, the advice they give, the results they produce. There's not really established and good models of how to do that. And I think that's another issue. Yeah, whole yeah. Space. chat GPT, that's a huge one at the moment. I'd love to get you back at some point. We could talk about that. But um, yeah, so I wanted to spend, uh, you know, the next 20 minutes or so with you talking about uh, locking contracts. You know, lock locking contracts, one of those things that um, at least with what I've found, a lot of SEO consultants are either all for it or completely against it. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes you get people in the middle. I never used SEO, uh, sorry, locking contracts within my agency. I found it, um, it was always, it always uh, introduced a bit, you know, too much friction and it created, you know, created friction during the sales process. So I never felt that I wanted to ever use lock-in contracts. And I, you know, I think part of that was due to the fact that I knew that I provided good work and I could get results. Um, what are your thoughts, uh, you know, when it comes to using lock-in contracts for SEO, because SEO is one of these things, right, where the outcome and the definition of results uh, is not always clear. I don't know if you've ever invested in SEO, but I know that there are plenty of people that are operating in the SEO space that say, hey, you know, work with us, pay us $2,500 a month after we'll do our best for the next 12 months. And the end result could quite literally be anything, but we want <laughs> we want to use we want you to sign and use this lock in contract. I've got a bit of a problem with that. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on you know when it comes to using lock in contracts for SEO. What do you think? Yeah, look, I think it's an interesting question. So I think SEO, if you just look at it from a purely technical standpoint, it's it's the nature of the service is as you just mentioned one where. The results don't happen immediately and it's quite highly technical for even your average customer to understand why those results aren't happening immediately so it's legitimate to understand why people would want to have some time period with which you know the customers you're investing all this time and setting things up some some time period with which customers can't cancel because you've invested time energy labor in something mm. that requires medium term to see results so you can you can you can sort of understand the business case why and i think on its face that is the point of a locking contract is to cover services like this where you know we're not seeing results regularly or there is some time period that's necessary to make the return on investment visible i think what the the issue that you run into is is a marketing or sales issue where you know you're trying to persuade a customer to sign up to your services and you're forcing them to agree to something it's not a simple if you don't like it 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 it, it, it you can switch it off uh, it just it puts friction in that sales process, sort of, as you mentioned. And so, um, while it might protect you legally by having them not have the ability to, to 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 cancel, you may get less volume of sales through because you know people are, are trepidatious about doing it. And ultimately, if competitors are not doing locking contracts, then um, I think it um, it makes it something that is, while you know, legally sensical. Uh, commercially nonsensical because you're not going to sell anything to people who have much lower sales volumes if you have these locking contracts. So we actually see in the SEO agreements that we draft, it's relatively rare for the, there to actually be lock-in agreements. I think um, people tend to get effective lock-in, not through terms and conditions that have penalties for cancellation or whatever it is, but rather building strong relationships, um, investing in some setup period where um, you know the customer 
invest time in that first month in setting up the whole SEO campaign or analysis or order or whatever's done and and such that it doesn't make commercial sense for the customer to cancel. So even if they technically could, they're not going to because they've got a good relationship with you. They, they'll feel the work that's happened in that early stage and you get them locked in for at least a period of time. They're, they're probably still going to cancel if they don't get results in six months. But if the service is delivered in a certain way, I think that the legal fine print becomes more of a barrier than a help in actually getting locked mm-hmm. in. And that's kind of a thing that we see people doing. I mean, we do commonly see in the SEO agreements like um, retainer models. So um, monthly retainer fees. Uh, and again, I think... Um, when people go to the effort, and again, you, you got to think about this in both legal and practical terms, but if people go to the effort of actually setting up the direct debit for the recurring billing, they set up regular meetings with you to discuss SEO strategy, there's an initial period and a three, four month plan. Again, the contract may say cancel at any time, but your average business having gone through the operations of setting up the system is unlikely to. So, you know, you, you can have your cake and eat it too. If you have good kind of pseudo lock-in operations and then a flexible agreement that you can say, if you don't like it, you can cancel it anytime. I think it's a better model of engagement. And again, one that we see a little bit more commonly um, with, our, with our clients doing SEO. Yeah. But there's a couple of things there that you touched on, um, uh, Alex, that I just want to revisit. Um, you said that uh, you're not seeing uh, lock-in contracts uh, so much, but you're, you are drafting SEO services agreements. There's obviously a difference between the two, right? Mm-mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So there's there's different ways of 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 designing your services agreement. So I think anyone who's um, providing SEO services should have a customer agreement of some description. That customer agreement can be a individualized agreement for a one-off service. It can be a uh, lock-in agreement that says, you know, you must pay me a certain amount for a fixed period of time. Um, sort of lock, locked in and, you know, you can't cancel before this period. It can be a retainer agreement, which says you're going to pay me a monthly fee, but you can cancel at any time. Um, or it could be a combination of all of them in one document with different options. So the the actual agreement itself from a legal perspective can kind of be called whatever you want and designed however you want. And it should really be designed to fit your business model. Um, and um, And then the question is, do you have a pure one-off service agreement? Do you have a service agreement with an optional lock-in add-on that people can do? Do you have a service agreement with a retainer option and a lock-in? You know, you can design them in many different ways, but I'd say the model that we see most commonly with SEO is a kind of retainer-based services agreement with with not really any lock-in element to it, yeah. Okay, so the re- the monthly retainer, um, I'm, I'm sure you're talking about the, the way in which clients pay. That's fairly standard the monthly retainer is standard within the industry mm. um but just to clarify uh, anyone that's operating in the um or well, anyone's providing seo services should at the very least be using some form of a services agreement regardless of as, uh, whether or not they're using uh they're locking clients in is that is that right yes i i think that's correct and the reason you want an agreement is for a few reasons first of all um even if you're providing a one-off service you want to make sure that you've limited your liability for things that might go wrong. If you're changing around people's websites or making suggestions to change their meta tags or you know, getting them to invest money in certain kinds of strategies and something goes wrong, you want to make sure, even if it's a one-off service or a retainer, whatever it is, there is clauses in your agreement that limit your liability. Ideally, limit them to nearly nothing if things go wrong. It's at the client's risk. But in most, most reasonable circumstances, you might say, well, if everything goes wrong because of my negligence as an SEO um, advisor, the most I'll ever be liable for you, to you for is a refund of your fees, but you can't sue me beyond that. So that's a very important reason you want an agreement. The second is like IP and strategy ownership. If you've got your own IP or strategies that you use and you want to reuse them for other clients, you just want to make it clear that you can do that and that your customer is not going to get um, ownership over your way of doing things, your documentation, your system, your processes just by working with you. And there's other clauses around, you know, payment, late payment, those sorts of things you can add in there. But at least those two around intellectual property and liability are, are one of the main reasons to always uh, look at having some form of agreement if you can. Yeah. And mm. um, the other thing that I wanted to um, touch on is uh, I think <clears throat> you mentioned just a moment ago, and this is probably true for large scale agencies, those, you know, with perhaps 80 staff, 900 clients, I think they're probably more likely to be using lock-in contracts because they have such 
you know, they've got those financial obligations and responsibilities and they can't be having clients flip-flop in and out for two months, try a little bit of SEO. So I understand large-scale agencies that are using lock-in contracts. I totally get that um, because they want to work with, and let's face it, we all do. We want to work with clients who are invested. Mm. Right? It, it, you know, It's like going to the gym. You can't hire a personal trainer so I want to look like the guy in the poster and do mm. two workouts and then cancel and then mm. be upset that you didn't get results. So mm. <clears throat> then I guess there needs to be some sort of commitment there from the client. So, I mean, I'm not opposed, to, you know, I'm not for or against using lock-in contracts. I think it's probably um, comes down to the situation, the way in which they're being used. Yeah. I mean, one thing we do see when they're used is discounted rates for annual commitments and those sorts of things. I think those things can be a way of securing your revenue streams as a service provider while also um, making it optional for the customer. So if they're not afraid about being locked in, they're happy to invest in it, then it's there and there's a benefit for doing so. If they're a bit nervous about it, you can start them off just building that relationship and then you can transition them into something a little bit more locked in in the medium term. Mm. And and again, the main barrier, I mean, lock-in is obviously just better to secure the revenue streams and for the business if you can, if you can get it. The main barrier to using it, I think, is just losing potential customers. Like, I think that's what, that's what you're going to lose if you try and push it too early. So... If there and, and that's why we don't sort of see that in the standard agreements. But if there's ways you can work it in to the way your service offering works, it's it's going to be better for you. So I think it's mm. something to to generally aspire towards. But I think you're also right in saying it also depends on the nature of your service, the way that you provide your services, um, and and then the types of clients you're working with, whether they're small or large, and and so on, and and, and how amenable they'll be to it. And, and that's probably the, the factors in considering how you design the model. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Um what you mentioned then about having some form of initial engagement. And this is something that we've spoken about in the group a number of times. And, you know, I've, I think I've made this suggestion a couple of times with a number of the members, you know, instead of locking someone in from the get go, consider working with the client for three months and then giving them that option of lock in from there. So you at least establish um, some sort of rapport or relationship and they, they know what to expect and you'll pass that, that stage of awkwardness. I mean, it, you know, this, this uh, topic of conversation comes up a lot. It's like you wouldn't ask someone to marry you that you just met in a bar. You, you need yeah. to date. You need to date first before you get to that point. So, um, and I think clients will probably be a lot more receptive to that, especially if you're offering there's some sort of financial incentive there, like a discount. Okay, if you lock in now for twelve months, we've been working together. You're comfortable. Lock in from here on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we can give you a. Uh, we can drop the hourly rate or offer a you know ten percent discount or something. Um, so, okay, that's all great. My next question here, Alex, what happens if the client wants to cancel the contract early? Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is where it gets a little bit a little bit wobbly. Um, you know, maybe exit fees, penalties. I mean, what's what tip, what do you typically see here? Yeah, it's interesting. And so, um, to some extent, there's you know the the wording of the agreement is going to tell you kind of how that plays out. So so it will depend on what kind of agreement you've used. But also in a lot of um, geographies um, around the world, there's actually some laws about, uh, you know, particularly small business or consumer contracts, what you can do and say around cancellation and exit fees and things as well. So you've just got to make sure you're aware of, you know, the laws of the region that you're in in case they might conflict with what you want to do. But but there's many different ways to handle the cancellation scenario, but typically, you know, you've got an agreement that you've set up at the beginning. There's a clause called cancellation, and that clause will say uh, something like, if the client cancels, um, you know, they must, you know, do X, Y, Z. They must provide me, the SEO advisor or consultant, you know, X days notice, um, and, you know, they'll still be liable to pay X, Y, Z fees. And, you know, we may charge an, uh, an an exit fee of XYZ and we may be able to recover any costs we've incurred on your behalf that you haven't reimbursed us for. So you might have a, that's a typical clause that you might see. Now, um, the the challenge with the, the um, having them locked in till the end of a billing period, I mean, it comes down to what the lock-in period is, but having them locked in if it's a monthly return to the end of the, of the monthly period is fairly usual and okay. If you charge penalties or exit fees, there's risks and there's risks under just general contract law, which applies in most countries where if you charge someone a penalty that doesn't reflect the actual cost to you of their cancellation, it's just like a, a, a sort of you've been naughty fee, um, then those things are actually uh, seen as unenforceable or unlawful and, and you can't actually um, enforce them. So the calculation of any fee that you're going to charge should make some logical sense in the sense that like, okay, well, 
um, for you for for me to charge you this exit fee, it's reflecting the fact that I allocated resources, I allocated time, I've done work for you, which I haven't yet billed you for because the nature of my billing model was that I was going to make it back in the in the next three months. So if there's some logic that you can show in the way that the service is described that there should be an exit fee or penalty, it's okay to charge them. But um, there are risks around them. And I think um, you also run into the risk of, again, it's a customer experience question more than a legal one. But um, you know, if you and find yourself in a dispute with a client where they owe you an exit fee and you're trying to bill them and they're mad and they're not going to pay it, well, you know, one, they're probably not going to have nice things to say about you to other people or in reviews of your business. And two, mm -hmm. um, even though technically you may be able to sue them, if the amount is not much, you're probably not going to bother starting legal proceedings against them. And so ultimately, it's not the most effective method. It might serve as a as a um, disincentive for people to to cancel it all because of the, because of the fees in the agreement, but um, you know I I just think it's 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 a little bit of a weak protection from cancellation mm. and and again I think the best ways are to maybe have um uh you know, work towards having the locked in periods if you can so it becomes more of a subscription or retainer based agreement and then you know have have that on a certain frequency and so if they cancel you at least have certainty to the end of that billing period i think that's that's fairly fair seen as fair by customers and unlikely to be challenged um and just, then the other just by that just by that alex, alex do you mean they pay out the remainder of sorry the what the remainder of what's left still owing so if they cancel and they're three months out from the end of the campaign they pay that three months is that what you're correct. saying correct okay. that's exactly what i'm saying so so have have a period of time that they're paying for which reflects the fact that you've sort of already done the work on that campaign. Um, another model I sometimes see is, let's say you've done, you're in a six month campaign, you've done three months work and um, you know they, they're meant to pay you the full amount or some amount at the end of the six month period for the whole campaign. What you can have is, as a clause, you sometimes see an agreement on cancellation that says, you know, the um, advisor or the SEO consultant will be entitled to a pro rata portion of the fees um, based on the amount of time that's passed between the campaign started and end date. So again, to put that in human terms, um, you know, you've got a, a six month campaign. They're going to pay you $6,000, let's say for the six month campaign, they cancel in month four, you get 4,000 because you've done four out of, out of six, if that makes sense. Or if it's month two, you get 2000. So that's another way that it's kind of handled where it can be, it can be done that way. Um, but, um, Obviously, it's better if you just get the full 6,000. You say, look, the wheels are in motion. Mm. We set aside time to work on this. So even if you cancel, I could have taken on... The justification is I could have taken on other client work or I could have been doing other things, but I've allocated my time to this project and hence yeah. you're going to need to pay it out. So yeah, that, that, I think, is the common way to handle it. Yeah, mm, That's a really good point. One other thing that I wanted to um, ask you, Alex, I'm sure you're probably seeing this a lot. Um, people that put their services agreement or their terms and conditions. I mean, terms and condition on their websites is probably fairly typical, mm -hmm. but what are your thoughts around digital signatures uh, using services like DocuSign and I think PandaDoc might be another one. That's probably become more commonplace, but could you take, let's say, <clears throat> your services agreement that might include, say, lock-in terms and put that on your website and then include a checkbox option where they make payment and then tie that is that is that a valid way of doing it? i mean does that would that something like that hold up if it went through legal proceedings absolutely it would in in um legal jargon we call these contracts uh click wrap agreements they're called and there's there's sort of two versions of the online contract at least two sometimes more um you've got the browse wrap agreement which is the one in the website terms and conditions that says hey by using this website you're taking to agree to these terms and that's what often, if you click on the tiny little terms and conditions at the bottom of a website, it says that those agreements are very questionable because it's known that nobody reads them and they never ticked any box. So, you know, it's it's often seen that those agreements wouldn't really hold up in, in court with some exceptions versus if you have a terms and conditions with a tick box and there's a positive action by the user to tick a box and say, I agree, um, those agreements are which are called click wrap agreements. So there's a click, clicking in, involved in actually accepting them are generally seen as valid legal agreements. In, in legal terms, the requirement for a you know signature where you scribble your your name and so on is, is not actually a requirement uh, under general contract law to create an agreement. You simply just need offer, uh, acceptance, 
um, intention to create legal relations, consideration. These are the elements of an agreement. And so acceptance, which is the one about the signature, generally just requires a really clear act of agreement that's unequivocal that shows acceptance. Now, what you want to make sure of using the tick box agreements is that you actually have evidence that the box was ticked and accepted because people could just say, I never ticked that box. Prove to me that I ticked that box. If you don't have some record on your website, which shows the timestamp at which time that box was ticked or some other circumstantial evidence that shows there was actually an agreement, then while you may actually have a legal contract, you got no proof that it ever happened and it's open for the other party to deny. So if you're using the tick box, you want to make sure you have some some record of it. And that's why the digital signature is a really effective way to right. have, have, have the agreement. You, you, you're generally going to get like a PDF downloadable version or even just a digital record with something that looks like a signature Right. timestamp and you know often um you okay. know these pki encryption keys mm -hmm. and that's why they're they're the best but a tick box is perfectly acceptable yeah yeah i've done both and i understand what you're saying i can <clears throat> excuse me i can understand that something like docusign where even if it isn't you know digital signature that would still probably hold a lot more weight because it's something that you can actually look at um and it's a it's an it's a task or a, an action that the uh, client has performed as for the checkbox, even if you make that compulsory, which you can do quite easily as when they're making payment, let's say, you can make that compulsory uh, and uh, enforce that before they make payment, even if, are you saying that even if you make that compulsory and they can't submit payment and begin, uh, you know, commence the services, even if you make that compulsory and they still go ahead, check the box, make payment, you start work, then they cancel it and say, I never checked, no, I didn't check any box. Yeah, that, that still becomes a problem. It, I mean, it could. It's not something that you see that frequently, but an argument could be mounted. So you would say, like, well, the fact that they can your argument would be the fact they completed payment means they must have ticked the box. That's what you would say. Yes. And they might say, no, you changed the website since I used it last. And unless you have some right. evidence that on that day at that time that you allege that they accept the agreement that the website looked like it does now, where you can't complete payment, then there's there's at least scope for it to be challenged. I mean, in practice, if you have, you know, if you had some record on your website, you know, that the form was completed, that the checkbox was included in at, at this certain timestamp, you had an email notification and you had um, Wayback Machine, that website often shows what website looks like. All those mm. things would be pretty strong surrounding evidence. So I don't think it's a real risk. I think a, a judge, if they saw all the surrounding factors, would probably believe you. Um, but it is still better to just have the digital signature if you can get it because you don't have to worry about any of this stuff. But I would just say, right. if, you're using, if you're using a checkbox, a lot of the checkbox software does record if it's in WordPress or something in the back end. It records the time the checkbox was accepted. That's pretty good. Mm. Like if you had that as evidence, that's pretty good. Right. But digital signatures is, yeah, as you can see, better. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think the foolproof way is using something that collects a digital signature as opposed yeah. to a checkbox. Um, I know we got a little bit, of, we went off a bit of a tangent there outside of uh, locking contracts. So to bring it back, dispute resolution what should be included uh, as part of that clause within the the contract first question you got to ask about it about dispute resolution is you know who's more likely to have a dispute here is it me or the customer and oftentimes if if you are the provider of the services the thing you're most concerned about is that you're going to get paid for the work that you've done on time um, and if you're the customer the thing that you're most concerned about is that the, the services are going to be performed with you know care, skill, professionalism, and, you know, it's not going to totally mess up their website and their ranking and all, all the other stuff that they're trying to sort of uh, achieve. Um, as a service provider, risk actually sits, depending on what you do, often sits more with you because, you know, the worst thing the customer can do is not pay you. The worst thing you can do is entirely ruin their business's reputation through some um, errors that you make in the SEO process. So um, I think you generally want to avoid the risk of being sued. Now, of course, if you want to avoid the risk of being sued, chances are you're going to have to make it slightly harder for you to sue your customer. But my view is, again, as a service provider, um, it's probably worth it on balance because you're probably unlikely to sue them just for fees and you're probably more interested in protecting yourself from being sued for, for negligence. So what you would typically want to include in your agreements, in your contracts, is a dispute resolution clause that says before the parties are able to take each other to court, they have to follow some process. And the process that we typically set out is step one, they've at least got to meet and try and resolve the, the dispute in good faith, whether that's a Zoom call or just a chat on the phone or some method where before we actually can take someone to court and sort of notice there's at least a conversation. 
So that's step one. You can add in a step two and sometimes a step three as well, where you say, if we can't work it out ourselves, we agree to go to a mediation. So that's some uh, a, a conversation, not in court, but just with a, a licensed mediator who's someone that tries to help you sort out the issue and come up with a resolution. Um, you can, as an optional third step, you can also put in arbitration, which is like an inexpensive alternative to going to court where, again, if all things go wrong, you go to a more inexpensive, inexpensive court with someone that still is going to make a final decision you both agree to be bound by. Um, but it, it saves the rigor and morale of appearing in a courtroom with you know, barristers <clears throat> right. and all that kind of stuff. Right. For small business agreements, we generally recommend people at least have a good faith negotiate clause and a mediation clause. And we don't really see small, medium businesses and, and sort of individuals end up in court because the value of the liability is, is too small. Um, and I think oftentimes the contract provides the protection against you potentially being sued if something astronomical goes wrong. Um, and it also provides just a real clear written agreement as to how this whole relationship works rather mm -hmm. than being a tool that people use to sue each other and things. Right. And I, th I think part of that is, yeah, mm -hmm. having these, these dispute resolution clauses. And that other element I mentioned earlier around liability. So the other thing that you want to include in the agreement is some clause that says, even if things go wrong, even if everything falls apart, the most I will be liable to you for is a refund of the fees. And if you want the refund of the fees, uh, on top of that, see this dispute resolution clause before you sue me for the refund, we're at least going to have a conversation about it. And if, if that doesn't work, a mediation. Mm. If you have that process, you've really reduced the risk of, at of attending a court, an expensive courtroom, which, as you said earlier, is not something people generally want to do if they could avoid it. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of SEO, I think it'd be fair to say that a lot of SEO consultants might uh, implement services agreements and perhaps lock in contracts simply because they want to ensure that they get paid. Mm, mm. And it, maybe it's uh, uh, fair to say that people enter into agreements for, for very different reasons. Mm. Clients clients are probably entering into uh, uh, agreements for their own reasons. But I think definitely from the SEO consultant's perspective, they just want to make sure that if things go pear-shaped, that they're going to get paid. Mm. Um, mm, mm. Ag 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 agreed. And, and the only thing I would add to that as a lawyer is definitely want to make sure you get paid. And you also want to make sure which is probably not a thing that people think about, but is my duty as the lawyer to inform everyone of, to make make sure that you're free from risk if things go wrong. Because mm -hmm. you could work for 150, 200 clients and everything could go really, really well, but then you get the really nasty 201 client where it all falls apart and you know they, they decide to sue you. We've had examples um, uh, you know, of clients, um, uh, not in the SEO space, but um, you know, in, in um, SEM, where you know they've controlled people's ad budgets, um, you know, added an extra zero to the daily budget by accident, spent tons of their clients' money, and and you know, as a small provider in in this case, uh, an, an individual provider, been potentially liable for millions of dollars. And what saved them from liability is having that agreement. Right. Um. So so it does have that mm. extra um, added benefit above above securing getting paid. But I think mm. you're right in saying, um, it is really useful as a tool for uh, recording the agreement and what was agreed in, in terms of how you're going to get paid. Um, I don't think if you don't get paid, it's super common unless it's a large amount of money to actually commence proceedings against clients. It's unlikely that you're going to bother in engaging um, litigation lawyers to, to sue them unless they really owe you, you know, more than mm -hmm. um, $20,000, $50,000 or something. Um, then you might start to get to the point where you actually want to commence proceedings. So it does really serve that almost commercial purpose um, to lock in your your, agree, uh, your your payment terms. Another another thing you can do um, just around making sure you get paid is, is you know, we talked a little bit about exit fees and penalties, but one clause we often put into these agreements is a late payment fee. So if people don't pay on time, you can have interest accrue on the amounts that they owe you. And again, that's a really good way if someone hasn't paid your invoice to say, hey, my invoice is late. By the way, under our under our agreement, you've got to pay interest for every month that you don't pay this thing. You might say, "I'm happy to waive it if you can pay it within the next couple of months," but I'm going to start have, having to charge interest if you don't pay it within a couple of months. And that could be a really good way to to turn the agreement into a payment incentive, if that makes sense. So yeah, right. that's that's one way they could be used. But again, yeah. it's not, it's it's unlikely. I think you're going to sue them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this this uh, conversation comes up a lot in and um, a number of the SEO communities where you'll have. A lot of SEO consultants saying, okay, if you haven't been paid, you've got a contract. Have you got a contract? Firstly, have you got a contract? And then, yes, if you've got a contract, then you need to enforce that and go through 
you know, as you said, all of the rigmarole that's involved in trying to chase down those outstanding that outs, those outstanding funds, in which case the legal proceedings and everything else could be far more expensive than the money that's actually owing. So, mm. um, you know, I think you make a good point there about perhaps it's not about that. Perhaps it's just about protecting yourself from from liability, yeah. Rather I, than having to, you know, we're signing into this agreement so that I I don't. Not that anyone doesn't want to get paid, mm. but you know, I, I missed out on you know six thousand dollars here. The clients cancelled their card, you know, gone to Mexico, done whatever it is. I'm not going to get my money. It's best to just let that go. Do you think actually, having said that, do you think there are a lot of clients that enter into a, uh, agreements like that knowing that in advance, or do you think I, most people generally work in good faith? I think I think a lot of people work in good faith, but like a lot of what we do working with smaller clients who we know are unlikely to have been, this, they're going to end up in the scenario you mentioned where if they have to enforce the agreement, it's going to potentially not be worth the money to invest in lawyers. So I think what, what we do is we try and structure the agreement in a way where they don't need to commence proceedings. And that may be through adding interest fees or recommending that they take upfront payment deposits or changing their billing structure so that they're not ending up in this scenario where there's an outstanding invoice where the client could not pay. Mm. I think that's that's what's like quite important. Like um, these agreements are kind of good faith commercial documents because the most, like I said, the most likely time anyone's going to get sued under the agreement is actually the client suing you for completely messing up their website and costing them tons of money. I think it's rare that you're going to sue them. So what you're really thinking about is how can I structure payments? How can I structure clauses? The client is going to abide by it in good faith. But, um, you know, obviously the best thing you can do is you can issue the deposit invoice and go, I'm not starting work or continuing work until you pay it. And you don't need to sue them. You're just actually not doing the work that they want. Mm. And they've all agreed that. So that's how you're going to get paid right under the contract. So I, I think thinking of contracts through that lens is very much a commercial deal structuring document rather than a, I'm going to sue you if I don't get paid my invoice, I think is a, is a really good way to think about these things. Yeah. Mm. I think, um, yeah, there was something that came to mind then, but uh, I mean, we could talk about uh, this at length, I'm sure. Um, maybe let's wrap it up, Alex, by um, covering the basics. You know, my, this is my last question. What should be included as part of, I mean, I know we kick things off with locking contracts, but maybe we could end it on um, just general contracts, perhaps, uh, to ensure, you know, that everyone's taken care of. So what, what would be some of the basic things that you need to have in place in terms of a service agreement? And maybe you could touch on and factor in some of that lock-in stuff if you think yeah. if it's yeah. it adds value. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, so in all of these agreements you've got with your customers, whether they're lock-in, not lock-in, uh, you know, you want to have uh, one, a service description clause. What is the service that you're providing? What's included in it? What is not included in it and may cost additional fees? Um, you know, what is, what is, uh, what results are you promising or not promising? In many cases, you don't want to promise any results. You want to say, I'm going to use my best, uh, endeavors to provide recommendations and advice on SEO strategies, but I can't guarantee that, you know, you're going to be number one on Google for every, every search term that you want to be or whatever it is. So, um, service disclaimers, in addition to service scope, um, payment we've touched on, um, I think payment's important. What is the amount that, that, uh, needs to be paid. When does it need to be paid? What's the method of payment? Um, is there interest um, uh, that they might have to pay on late payments? Um, are we in a lock-in scenario or are we in a non-lock-in scenario? Um, and, and how are those payments structured? So that's obviously the clause that you're going to want to think about how you structure that. And you may vary that a little from client to client, but that's a, a very important concept. Um, touched on earlier, intellectual property um, and confidentiality clauses. The main purpose of that is to make sure that you may have your own strategies, documentation, processes, systems you use for your SEO um, uh, advice or, or business. Those are yours. They're not the clients. You can use them with other people. You want to make sure that's clear so they don't have ownership over what you're doing and you can continue to do what you're doing. Um, finally, the liability clauses um, around, we touched on protecting yourself from a risk. If something goes wrong, you want to just make sure that you can't be sued um, and, uh, and, um, you know, the, the maximum liability you have is in general terms, the refund of the fees, um, then sort of termination clauses. Um, how do we get out of this agreement? What, what does cancellation look like? As we discussed earlier, are there cancellation and exit fees? Is it just payable at the end of the term? If we're midway through the, some campaign, how does that work and, and who gets paid what? So 
that's that, those are the probably key elements of the agreement. Um, and and I think if you cover, kind of cover all of those things off, it's going to be pretty robust. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. There's certainly a lot to uh, to take into account, isn't there? There really sure. is. Um, one thing that I will mention that I uh, probably should have on that previous point was um, this is something I talk about in the group at length. You know, get paid first, automate billing, mm. stay away from manual invoicing because it just introduces too many problems around, you know, especially having to chase uh, either non payment or late payment, uh, set up automated billing where the transaction is deducted automatically each month. And of course, all of those terms would be outlined in your services agreement. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I strong, strongly agree with that. And I think, um, you know, the best way to ensure you get paid is to actually build it into the process and the technology mm. that you use to collect payment. Because um, if you've got direct debit set up, um, you know, it, it means that even if someone wants to breach the agreement, it's very difficult for them to do so because the direct debit's going to come through. So um, yeah. so that's one of the best ways you could do things, yeah. Well, let's, uh, yeah, let's, this has been fantastic, Alex. If someone is interested in working with you, they want you know wanting to put together a services agreement or want some assistance with uh, lock-in contract perhaps something to yeah. do with uh, I mean you don't just specialize in SEO you do all aspects of uh, digital marketing services yes yeah we, we, we pretty much can help with any area of law that people need help with um, we're, we're active in Australia UK New Zealand so if people want to go to our website sprintlaw.com.au or co.nz or co.uk um, and and submit an inquiry uh, our team can sort of get in touch and um, we do a lot of work with digital businesses. Uh, I mentioned we worked quite a lot with SEO advisors and consultants, but we can also um, you know, help with employment agreements, trademark registrations, privacy, pretty much anything legal anyone needs. Right. That is the point of Sprint Law. So definitely feel free to reach out if people are yeah. interested. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, thanks again, Alex, for spending some time with us and uh, look forward to having you on again, hopefully soon. Thanks, John. Was Cheers. Fun. Hey, if you've enjoyed this episode and you'd like to learn more, you have to come check out the SEO Accelerator program. It's my monthly coaching program where we take all of this material and we apply it. We take it to the next level and we study it. Join me over at bringtheseo.com. I'd love to have you join me inside the SEO Accelerator program. I'll see you there.